First and foremost, we want to bow our heads in a word of prayer as we look to the Lord for, amen, strength, wisdom, understanding, amen, and his certainly Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth, amen. So let's bow, amen, before the throne of grace. Father, we thank you for new mercy as we awaken this morning. We were in our right minds. Amen. And we still have a mind to serve you and to take the yoke and learn of you. Lord, help us tonight as we delve into your word. Let your word reign true in us. Let it speak to our heart. Let your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and direct our pathway, O oh God. We want to be that people. Amen. Call by your name. Amen. Hearing your voice say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, bless each and every listening ear. Be thou glorified in your people. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you. Tonight we begin a new series, a new study in the Gospel of John. Amen. In the Gospel of John. Amen. We're going to be, amen, for the next several, several weeks, amen, looking at this magnificent uh, and unique gospel written by the Apostle John, amen. And on tonight, we're going to, first of all, do a little bit of an introduction, um, a brief introduction. I'm trying to keep it as brief as possible because there is much, much material in the book of John, in the Gospel of John. And so we want to, amen, keep the introduction as brief as possible. And by the way, for those of you well, following along with us, uh, we do have a book that was requested, someone requested that perhaps, or suggested that we uh, have some books made available, and I'll give you that information a little later. We did secure, amen, some books. And so for those of you who would be interested in securing a book, please let me know, amen. It is a commentary, but we are going to be in the Bible. We're not gonna be following the book. We're going to be in the Bible exclusively in the Bible. If there are things that we need to point out or draw from the book, we may do that, but the book is simply supplementary and not, amen, the text of which we will be using. And again, I have a few copies and those of you who would be interested, just please let me know uh, after tonight and by next week and we will uh, secure a copy for you, amen. All right, um, let me begin with the introduction. Uh, the Gospel of John is uh, unique. And again, this is the introduction that I sent to you if you have it already, uh, you can follow along. I sent that to you this morning. So uh, just wanna point out a few things about the Gospel of John, the uniqueness of it, and both the style and the content, amen. It is different from the other diverse from the other three Gospels. And of course, as you know, uh, the other three Gospels are referred to as the Synoptic Gospels because they have a lot of common material, a lot of common stories, a lot of common uh, parables or events, uh, certain things that Jesus did or said. Uh, it is uh, uh, in, you can find it in particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke in some instances. Now Luke's gospel to me is extraordinarily unique, but nevertheless, it is a man included in these three as being synoptic in the sense that the material that is contained in those three gospels, they have a lot of similar material, but the gospel of John is very unique. Like I said, in both the style and the content of it, uh, and, uh, but it is extremely complementary, and, and, and it is also cohesive to the other three Gospels uh, because it helps us with the identity of Christ from a very different perspective and also uh, with the purpose because Jesus states emphatically in this Gospel who he is and why he came. I mean, he said it. In the other Gospels, it's recorded in uh, the other Gospels, but nothing like in the Gospel of John, uh, as we're going to see. 
And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is presented um, as the Messiah King. In the Gospel of Luke, uh, Mark rather, he is uh, more or less seen as the suffering servant. And when you look through Luke's Gospel, he's summed up as the Son of Man. Um, and again, in the Gospel of John, it's what we're going to be exploring, Jesus is unquestionably the Son of the living God, God incarnate. And so, uh, again, as we look through this, this is what we're going to see, the uniqueness of the Gospel of John. He doesn't, as the other Gospels, two of the other Gospels, uh, Matthew and Luke, give a genealogy. There is no genealogy in the Gospel of Mark and certainly not a genealogy in the Gospel of John. John says in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word was made flesh. He doesn't go anywhere to the human origin of Jesus, but he goes straight to a man, the deity uh, where Jesus originated from. Um, from heaven, from the beginning, he always was. And so the author of the Gospel of John is the Apostle John. The Apostle John himself, who was uniquely qualified, uniquely positioned, um, not only as one of the 12 apostles, but John was in that inner circle. Circle. You had Peter, James, and John. James and John were brothers. They were called the Sons of Thunder. And uh, they were all fishermen. They had a lot in common, Peter, James, and John. But uh, they, these three comprised the inner circle and they witnessed some things that the other uh, disciples did not witness. For example, the transfiguration, which was a huge, huge, amen, and special moment when they, amen, saw Jesus transfigured before their faces. I mean, before their eyes, and they saw him standing there on the mountain talking with Moses and Elijah. And uh, they wanted to build a tabernacle. Peter, of course, always first to speak, wanted to build a tabernacle there for the three of them. And, and uh, of course, that, that was uh, not a, a great idea, and it never happened. But nevertheless, these three, Peter, James, and John, uh, were in the inner circle and uh, John was certainly uniquely qualified to write about the things that he witnessed, the things that he saw, and he was privileged um, to be the recipient and also the recording author of the book of Revelation, as we also know. Amen. The book of Revelation, uh, which is the final complementary uh, curtain call of um, the whole counsel of God that has been made known to us. Now, you uh, also should know that the same Apostle John authored the three letters or three epistles, first, second, and third John as well. So he, amen, again, is the author of this gospel that, again, is very unique and what we want to look at very quickly is the purpose, the purpose, the purpose. And oftentimes in some of the books of the Bible, you will have different commentators or theologians search through and try to, you know, develop or find what the theme is, what the purpose is and all of that. Well, in the Gospel of John, you didn't have to do it. Amen. Well, thank God we didn't have to do it here because the purpose is given to us by John himself. Amen. And it's found in chapter number 20 toward the end of the book. There's two verses there we'll read very quickly. Uh, so it's not left to our speculation. Amen. Uh, John chapter 20 verses 30 and 31. John writes these words. He says, and truly Jesus did many other signs or miracles, if you will, in the presence of his disciples. So again, they were witnesses of all that Jesus did. Amen. He says, which are not written in this book. So he chose not to write about many, many signs that Jesus did. And that's, I'm going to just um, tell you a few of those. We'll get to those also. 
as well uh, the signs that John chose chose to conclude in his amen writing but listen what he says they are not written in this book but these are written the ones that I have chosen the ones that were selected the ones that I've included these were written that you may believe this is the purpose that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that believing you may have life in his name that is the purpose of John writing this book to amen the reader for the reader to believe amen that Jesus is the Christ Jesus is the Son of God and that believing the reader may have life in his name believe in him and live this is what it's all about and the word believe by the way is used approximately 100 times 100 times in the gospel of John twice as much as any of the other gospels 100 times believe believe but Jesus himself said it many times believe 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 amen believe amen and this is what faith is all about believing amen so uh as we're going to see again as we go through the gospels and i alluded to this already earlier john uh included in his gospel seven miracles or signs during the ministry of jesus there's an eighth one that is at the end of the book after jesus had been crucified rose from the dead and came back to visit with the disciples that was an eighth sign, but the seven that he chose during the ministry of Jesus is what we're going to see. Amen. And it also, again, he said these are included. These are there to, amen, um, persuade, if you will, you to believe. Amen. Number one, we're going to see the water made into wine. Y'all remember that one? The wedding feast uh, at Cana. That's in chapter number two. And uh, the second miracle was the healing of the royal official's son. That's in chapter number four. The healing of the lame man at the temple, at, I'm sorry, at the pool of Bethesda. Y'all remember that? All right, that one is unique. All of the, these are unique in the Gospel of John, by the way, uh, with the exception of the feeding of the multitude. He has one of those in chapter number six. The walking on the water. The healing of the blind man in chapter 9. Now, the other Gospels do record the healing of other blind, but not this particular uh, healing that Jesus did on this particular man. Uh, so this particular miracle was uniquely recorded by John. And finally, number 7, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Matthew, Mark, nor Luke made any mention of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Now again, there were other resurrections, or, ra or not resurrections, but raising of people from the dead that Jesus did in the other gospels, but not the Lazarus incident. It's just, this is exclusive to the gospel of John. Now John also has um, in his gospel uh, exclusive dialogue or conversations um, that occurred between Jesus and different individuals uh, i don't think this is in your outline here um but namely um the pharisees the sadducees uh the scribes other unbelievers many of the jews of course who are unbelieving and as john said in the prologue of the gospel he came unto his own and his own what received him not so he it, and in john we're going to see uh many uh different conversations if you will which really turned the town into confrontations and many in most of the cases they confronted Jesus they came to him they came trying to entrap him but Jesus always had a response now he didn't always answer their questions as we're going to see but he always had a response if he chose to respond and so this is in the Gospel of John some very unique conversations also y'all remember he had a full course the, the, the very famous and lengthy conversation that turned 
with, with a lot of, I mean, whew. matter of fact, it contains the most famous verse in all of the world, I guess. John 3, 16, for God so loved. That conversation was with who? Nicodemus. That was part of the conversation Jesus was having with Nicodemus. And then in chapter number four, I believe it is, uh, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, he had a conversation, a lengthy conversation with her. We're going to see that. And also he had a brief conversation in his, his encounter with the healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And uh, certainly uh, toward the end of the chapters, uh, end of the gospel, Jesus certainly had, amen, unique and uh, certainly intimate conversations with his own disciples. And we're going to see that as well. And by the way, in the Gospel of John, uh, the uh, conversation and the instruction and the um, information that we receive about the Holy Spirit is unique and far more inclusive than any, other, any of the other Gospels. And this is when Jesus was talking about the Comforter and uh, all of those things, and that's what we're going to see as well. So the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is explained to us in the Gospel of John uniquely as well. And also, of course, you know, uh, John's Gospel contains these seven emphatic I am statements of Jesus, which identify Jesus as God incarnate. Amen. Remember, this goes back to the Old Testament. And um, when he told Moses, I am that I am. Amen. I am the I am. So when Jesus makes these I am statements, he's um, not just saying I am in a, in, in a kind of, you know, casual sense. Uh, this is uh, all about his deity and who he is. Amen. In his um, in his work, in his personhood in his uh, unique identity and also in his ministry what he came down here to do he says I am the bread of life I am the light of the world I am the door or the gatekeeper for the sheep I am the good shepherd I am the resurrection and the life I am the way the truth the life amen and he and also in the final one in John, John chapter 15 he says I am the true vine. I am the true vine. Now, again, when we get to these statements that Jesus makes, when we're going to see wrapped in these statements um, or around all of these I am statements, there is, um, amen, some very powerful dialogue and, 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 and these words that Jesus uses in these cases that we're going to see, it serves even to this day to um, it, it serves as a sword, really, to divide those who believe from those who don't believe, those who uh, say they believe. Because when Jesus, for example, says, I am the bread of life. And he said, except you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink, you have no life. You have no part. And a lot of people who were disciples, the Bible says, they will follow. The disciple means you follow. They were following Jesus around. Now, many, many of the people, as we, we're going to see also, were following Jesus because of the miracle signs and also because they ate of the loaves and were full. And so when Jesus got to the hard sayings, though, when he got to the tough stuff, Many of them, the Bible says, went away. And so these statements that Jesus makes also severs or separates the wheat from the chaff. So this is what we're going to also see as we go through these, amen, um, different I am statements, certainly. A lot of theology there. And again, John wrote these words, included these signs, included these statements. Amen. Unique statements that Jesus made to, amen, persuade the hearer, the believe, the reader to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the son of God. And in believing, you will have life. Amen. Life through him. All right. Let's begin. Uh, we're going to go to uh, chapter number one, beginning 
with the very first verse, of course, John chapter 1, verse number 1. And tonight we're going to only cover the first 18 verses, and we will get through chapter 1 on next week. But we want to begin with, and, and, and I'm going to try to be as brief as I possibly can, and certainly please, if you have any questions at any point, um, feel free to raise your hand or, um, and, and, or you have a, you know, a comment or whatever the case may be so that we can um, hopefully um, engage in this dialogue, amen, about Jesus as we go along here. All right, let's begin with verse number one, and we'll, let's, let's read the first uh, five verses, amen, beginning in John chapter one, the first five verses. All right, in the what? Beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Amen. All right. Wow. That's a lot, y'all. Yeah, that, that, that's a lot of stuff in there. Woo -woo. All right. In the beginning was the word. Word. What word? What does he mean, word? Word. The word. Well, is he talking about the Bible? Not the Bible. He's not talking about the Bible. In the beginning was the Bible. The Bible is the word of God, is it? Is it not? Is it, is it the word of God? The Bible is God's revelation to us. Amen. Part of his revelation to us, if you will. But he's not talking about the Bible here, certainly. And as you can see, the word, word is capitalized. Amen. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word what? The word was God. The word it God and his word are inseparable. God and his word are in I wish, oh God, I wish the church understood that and knew that. I wish we did. I wish we did because we 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 don't take uh, many of the things that God say has said, has spoken. We don't take it to heart. But if we understood that everything, that's why Jesus said from the very outset, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. If we understood that the promises of God, as the Bible tells us, all of them, all of them are yea and amen to the glory of God. God cannot take back and he will not take back any of his word. That's why Jesus made it emphatically clear when he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my, my word, my word has gone forth out of my mouth and it shall not return unto me. Do you realize that if God failed, which he cannot do, by the way, in any aspect of his word, he would cease to be God. He would cease to be God. And he cannot cease to be God, so his word cannot fail, and it will not fail. I don't care how bleak things may look. I don't care how bad things may look. What does the word of God tell us? What has God spoken? What has God made? No, in the beginning, before all of this came into existence before this world was created, before man was created, before chaos came into the world, before sin came into the world, the word was already established. It was already established. It was already decreed. It was already determined. It was already spoken. And it shall not change. Just because man has sinned, just because man has rebelled, just because 
Satan and a third of the angels rebelled against God. God created all of us with free will, if you will. The ability to make choices. We are moral creatures and we have the ability to obey God, disobey God. And so God, in the beginning, his word, who he is, inseparable. And so the word was with God in the beginning because the word was God. So the word always was. The living word. Now again, not your Bible that collects dust on your living room table. People used to have them on the table. They don't have them. They don't have them no more. Not the one that's sitting in the back of your car in the trunk or on the back of the, uh, you know, the window in the back of the car or tucked away, you know, somewhere. No, 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 not, no, not, the, not this, not this, not this that I have in my hand. No, no, no. The living word, God himself. The word that is the logos that is inseparable from God. The Bible says he was so the, the word is now identified as a he, as personhood. He was in the beginning with God. As a matter of fact, when you go to the book of Revelation, it talks about Jesus. I believe the Bible speaks of a name written on his thigh. The word of God. Is that is that there? I believe so. But let me let me move on quickly. Uh, I told you this. I love this. Is this is I got we got we got a little ways to go here. Okay, so this is the word. The word God and His word inseparable because they are one. Amen. And so listen what He says in verse number three. Let's read that again. He says what? All things were what? A, all things were made through him or by him. Who is him? Again, there's a, there's a pronoun there. It's referring to personhood. All things were made through him. Him who? The word that was made flesh. The Bible says the word that was in the beginning. All things were made through him and without him or apart from him, nothing. nothing. Now you look around in our world today and we got a lot of things that have been made. But please understand that man has created nothing. Man does not create any. I know people say, oh, he's so creative. But man has created absolutely nothing all that we've done and I'm not disparaging because God gave us the wisdom and knowledge he made us in his image and his likeness and he gave us the dominion in the earth and he told us to subdue it and all of those things and we've gone about doing it and we would be far 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 farther farther along had it not been for sin of course Nevertheless, we create nothing because everything was made by God. Now, everything that we make, we make from something that was already made. We have no creativity of substance, even the energy that we produce comes from something that was already made. We create nothing. We only discovered what God has here. Y'all remember your scientific tables of the elements when you're in uh, physics? Was it physics? Primarily, I think. Is it physics? I know they. I know it's in physics, chemistry and physics. Chemistry and physics. You should learn your the elements. Solids and gases. They're invisible things that we have in this world that 
We can't see with the natural eye, with the naked eye, but God put them here. The gases, and then all of the solids, the elements that we use from the earth. God created all of these things. All things were made through him or by him and without him or apart from him, nothing, nothing was made that was made. So verse number four says what? In him was life and the life was what? We don't live without him. We don't breathe without him. We don't move without him. Amen. We don't get up in the morning without him. Matter of fact, you don't even go to bed tonight without him or apart from him. And that life is the light of man. Now, if we don't have the light, we are in what? Darkness. If we don't have the light, we are in darkness. So the Bible says the light, verse number five, what? The light, what? Shines in the darkness and the darkness. Oh, wow. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness does not comprehend it. And, 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 and again, we're going to see a little bit of this when we get to chapter three, when Jesus talks about man, a man, uh, men rather loving the darkness rather than the light. Because when the light comes, what happens to the darkness? The darkness goes away. The darkness goes away instantly. Anytime light comes, darkness has to flee. The light shines in the darkness and, and, and this, this world, by the way, is where the darkness is. The darkness, is, that's why, I again, when we get to the I am statement, Jesus, I'm the light of the world. I've come to bring light into the darkness, to dispel the darkness. And so when Jesus comes, he shines into the darkness, but the darkness doesn't comprehend it. The darkness doesn't understand. That's why he tells us also to let, don't make it, don't make it shine. He said, let your what? Light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Now, again, the light shines, but the darkness doesn't comprehend that light. Amen. And so we, amen, having this great salvation are in the light. Amen. And thank God the light has shined in our hearts and we have, amen, uh, uh, come to the light and that light is Jesus Christ himself again. In him was life, verse four. Life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness does not comprehend it. All right, let's read on. Let's move on to our next sec section here. Amen. Verses six through eight. Amen. Read. Let's see. Verses six through eight. Amen. Uh, chapter one. All right, let's read. All right, let's hold it right there. Now, the light. Now, he's talking about the light. The Bible tells us here, he introduces the forerunner here, John does in his gospel. This is not John the apostle who wrote. This is John the Baptist that he's referring to here. So he says, there was a man sent from God. God sent him. And again, if you go to the gospel of Luke, you can certainly see the account even uh, Luke details how the birth of John the Baptist came about. But this man, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, the Bible says he was sent from God and he came for a witness to bear witness of the light. And you remember John's testimony. We're going to see some of that uh, as we move along here. 
so that all through him might believe. Now, listen what, listen what John writes about John the Baptist. He says of John the Baptist in verse number eight, John the Baptist was, was not that light. He was not that light, but was sent to do what? Bear to bear witness of that light. And so it is with all of us. That's what we've been sent to bear witness of that light. Amen. We are ambassadors of Christ. We've been sent to bear witness of him, Jesus. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's the savior. He's the redeemer. And we are to preach Jesus Christ, the gospel. And that's what Jesus commissioned the church to do, his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized, what? Shall be saved. And that's why Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other. The light, if you stay in the darkness, amen. Verse nine, that was the what? True light. You got a lot of false lights that, that won't last. It may flicker for a moment. They may look like the real thing, but it's not the real thing. There's only one true light. The Bible says this light gives light to what? Every, y'all see that verse nine? To every man coming into the world. Remember what he said. Go back, look at, look, 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 look back. Look at, look back at verse number four. In him was life and the life was the what? Light of men. And when every one of us comes into the world, the light that is in us comes because of him. The true light gives light to everyone who comes into this world. So now John speaks of his incarnation when he came into the world. Look at verse 10. He said he was what? In the world. He was in the world and the what? The world, was made through him. the world was made through him and the world what? Did not know him. Wow, did not even know the one who made the one who made them. Now he's not speaking of the world in the sense of the land, the seas, the, even the creatures of the animal world, if you will. He's talking about man and the world system. They didn't know him. Amen. They did not receive him. He came to his own. Now his own, what, who are his own? The Jews. The Jews. He came directly to them. Amen. And the Bible says his own people did not receive him. Amen. And they should have known. And why should they have known? Because they had all of the prophets. They had all of this exclusively. They had all these things exclusively to themselves. The Gentiles were without hope. They were lost. They didn't have it unless you became a proselyte. Unless you joined yourself to the nation of Israel. You were in total darkness. You were left out. So Jesus came to his own people who had all of the prophecies. Right down to the very date that was given in Daniel. Right down to, and, and the wise, now, some wise men knew. Y'all remember that? The wise men that came said, where is he born the king of the Jews? We have seen this star in the east. And then when they, when they, was, they were questioned about it, he said, well, that's what it said in the prophets. He was going to be born in Bethlehem and all of these. So they knew the place. They knew the time. And yet when he came, and even though he did so many miracles and signs, as we're going to see, all the miracles, signs, and wonders that he did, they still did not believe. As a matter of fact, they had the gall to come to Jesus on one occasion. I think this is uniquely also in the Gospel of John. How long will you make us to doubt? How long, Jesus, you making us doubt? Blaming Jesus. Isn't that something? You blame Jesus for your unbelief. Wow. So the Bible says he came to his own. His own did not receive him. But verse 12, what? As many as received him, to them 
he gave the what? The right to become what? The children of God to those who what? There it is. Believe, believe, believe. To those who believe what? In his name. Neither is there salvation in any other. If you put your faith, your trust, your hope, your confidence in anybody else, anything else, you have no salvation. You have no hope of salvation. Because salvation can only come by him. It's only and exclusively through him. Neither is there salvation in any other. Believe on him. Believe in him. Believe him. On him, in him, and him. Believe on him, believe in him, and believe him. A lot of people say they believe, but they don't believe him. A lot of people say they believers. They don't really believe what the Bible says. They don't really believe what God says. Amen. I, they say, I believe there is a God. What? So what? James said, so what? You gonna pat yourself on the back for that? He said, the devils believe and they tremble. So what? Amen. But do you believe in him? Amen. And this is what Jesus is going to issue the challenge to his disciples later about their faith. Amen. He said, if you are my disciples, amen, uh, you're going to um, you're going to do what I say. Uh, my commandments, you're going to keep my commandments. Amen. So if you really believe in him, then you obey him as well. All right. Verse 13, those who believe in his name who were born what? Not of, blood. Not of blood. In other words, don't come with your genealogy. Don't come with your, I'm of the seed of Abraham, I'm of the lost tribes of Israel. I'm really a Jew or I'm this, I'm that. You know, or my grandfather, great grandfather, great 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 grandfather, all of my all of my kin folks were uh, ministers. So that automatically gives you some no. Mm -mm. It's not 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 of blood, not of anything human at all. He says, This birth that he's gonna again he's gonna get into this dialogue with Nicodemus about this new birth. This birth, they were born not of blood, not of the what? Will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but this birth comes of who? Of God, of God only. All right? Verse 14, and the what? The word, there it is. There it is. The word. We go back again to verse number one. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. The word became flesh. Jesus came to take on a body. Now, why? Why did he come? Why? I mean, it's, it's several reasons. I have one main reason that I, you know, people want, trying to understand why was it necessary for Jesus to come into the world? Why was it, why, did, why, why, why couldn't he just, why couldn't God just do this from heaven? Why couldn't he just zap and just say, zzzz, your sins are forgiven, your sin. Why did Jesus have to come? Why? Why was he made flesh? Why? It was promised, yes. That's one reason. What else, though? Why, why was it necessary? Why was it necessary? The blood atonement. It had to be the blood atonement. Now, as we're going to see, when Jesus has this dialogue with this woman, he's going to say, God is spirit. A spirit does not have a body. A spirit does not have blood. 
So in the incarnation, with Jesus coming down to take on human flesh, and also he, in the book of Hebrews it said, because the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise took part of the same. And that's why we have a merciful and high priest who knows the things that we go through. He understands our weaknesses. He understands what it's like to live in a house of clay. He understands what it's like to be hungry, to be thirsty. He understands what it's like to be tempted. He was in all points, the Bible says, tempted just like we are, yet without sin. But it was necessary for blood to be shed and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, period. Now, again, you can say, well, what about the people under the law? What about before Jesus came? Well, the Bible says that the blood of bulls, the blood of goats, blood of all of those other animals, none of those could take away sins, nor could they cleanse the conscience, nor could they make anyone perfect. Couldn't perfect, it did, it did not, it was a shadow of what was to come. And when Jesus came and the Bible says once in the end, he appeared to take away sins. Now, when Jesus came and shed his blood, his blood covered sins past, present, and future. That's why even on the cross before his blood was poured out when the, the final of his blood was poured out when the, the soldier pierced him in the side. He was already bleeding from the beating and bleeding from the crown of thorns that was platted on his head and the spikes and, the, and through his hands and feet. He was already bleeding from that. But, 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 but even before the final and the complete completing of the atonement, the blood being poured out on that cross, he said to that thief, today, you, you're forgiven. Your sins are atoned for. Today, you'll be, you'll be in paradise. Now, again, our sins, well, what about, my, what about my sins? What about your sins? What about our sins? What about the sins you haven't committed yet? So if Jesus forgave my sins, well, what sins did he forgive? What sins did he wash away? Only those sins before you were saved? Don't tell me you've never sinned since you. Because that's not the same John writes about that. If we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. But if we can, we, he's talking, he's talking to the church. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Jesus came to take away sins through the atoning of his blood past present and future all sins washed away in the sea of forgiveness by that one sacrifice the only acceptable sacrifice because our blood is tainted you can't even give you know do you realize you can't even give your own blood you can't give your own blood paul said if i give my body to be burned it profits me nothing i have not we have nothing to give we are born in sin, shaping in iniquity. Our D, it's in our DNA. Sin and corruption is in our DNA. And so Jesus was made flesh, amen, for a multitude of purposes, also to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. A lot of things Jesus is going to state, or he said that he came for to be our example to, amen, um, bring in or usher in as we're going to see here grace and truth um, that was uh, and, and also to um, not destroy the law and the prophets but to fulfill so he came for a multitude of purposes but primarily a body was prepared a body thou hast prepared for me because with the blood of bulls the blood of goats um, it's not possible, the Bible says. It was not possible that the blood of animals could take away sins. So a body was prepared. That's why Jesus had to come, and that's why he had to go to the cross. He had to go. 
All right. So the word became flesh, dwelt among us. And John says he was an eyewitness. We beheld his glory. Now, one of the reasons, one of the things he's uh, certainly speaking about this, uh, I mean, uh, referring to here is the Mount of Transfiguration that I alluded to earlier. John was there. We beheld his glory. We saw him transfigured before our face. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 15, what? John bore witness of him, speaking of John the Baptist, John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was what? He of whom I said, he who comes after me is what? He is preferred before me for he what? He was before me. That's why Jesus said, well, we're going to see that later. When you saw that conversation, come on those conversations with the Jews. Before Abraham was, I am. And John understands that Jesus was before him. Verse 16, and what? Of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law could not, cannot, and did not save anybody. The law could only point out no one under the law was saved by the law. No one. Read Romans chapter 7. Read Romans period. Amen. You're not saved by the law. You're not saved by works. By the deeds of the... It's in the Bible. I hope you read your Bible. By the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. You say, well, what about the people who were under the law? What about... What about how were they saved? I just told you. It was the blood of Jesus. Past, present, and future. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, but was manifested, Galatians, in the fullness of time. When the time came, what was promised in Genesis chapter 3 came to in the incarnation, in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. All right? So all of the prophecies, and that was that's why they went through all of that. God had to bring a people into revelation, into, amen, into covenant relationship with him. And through them, through this nation, through the seed of Abraham came Christ Jesus, through the seed of David. Amen. So, amen. The law was given through Moses, but the law saved no one. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has, listen to what the Bible says, no one has what? No one has seen God at any time. You can't see God and live. Not in this flesh. We're going to see him in our glorified bodies. Amen. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, Christ Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared, he has made him manifest, he has sent him forth, if you will. He has, through the incarnation, taking on human flesh. He is, as the writer of Hebrews says, the very image of the invisible God. And in him, as we're going to see, is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's God manifested in the flesh, God incarnate, called the Son of God. Amen. All right, we're going to uh, end it there for tonight at verse number 18. We'll pick it up uh, in uh, chapter 1 and conclude next week. Uh, verses 19, 19 through 50. Amen. 19 through 50. Um, and time permitting, we may go into a portion of chapter 2 uh, uh, as well on next week. All right. Amen. All right. So that concludes our introduction and a portion of 
chapter one on tonight. Anyone have any questions or comments? Amen. Before we, amen, uh, close out on tonight, any questions or comments? Amen. All right, if not, God bless you, everyone. We thank you again for your, amen, your patience, your attendance, and uh, let us, amen, um, allow the word of God to, amen, live in us and be in us, amen, as we, amen, run this race patiently, looking for that blessed hope and appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen, all right.